Hello and a warm welcome to everyone tuning in. My name is Rosa and I'm Assistant Curator for Exhibitions and Public Programs at Spike Island. And I'm very happy to be introducing today's Behind the Scenes with artist Vicky Smith. This series is designed as a chance to explore artists and makers studios at Spike Island, to catch a glimpse of their working environments, learn about their practice, their processes, and sometimes even view works in progress. Vicky has very kindly agreed for us to screen a few of her works throughout our conversation today, so do keep tuned in for this special opportunity. Before we start though, I have some housekeeping to just quickly get through. Spike Island's public programs seek to create an environment for critical and open-minded discussion. We strongly encourage you to use the chat function available through YouTube Live to write any questions you may have throughout the event, and I'll field these to Vicky at um, appropriate moments as we go. Um, and a reminder that any aggressive, discriminatory or intolerant comments will be removed by our moderators um, in keeping with our aims to create a respectful and generative environment for everyone involved. For more information, you can read our code of conduct that should be in the chat box very soon. Okay, and so to introduce our fantastic guest today, Dr. Vicky Smith is a British artist, filmmaker and academic who has worked in experimental animation and film for over 30 years. Her work has been screened in galleries and at festivals internationally, including at the Barbican Centre in London, SF MoMA in San Francisco, the Tate Modern, Edinburgh Film Festival, and the London Short Film Festival, amongst many others. She has authored essays in many journals, and in 2018, she co-edited a book with Nikki Hamlin titled Experimental and Expanded Animation, Current Perspectives that received the McLaren Lambert Best Scholarly Book in Animation Award. Vicky is also a co-founder of artist collective Bristol Experimental Expanded Film, otherwise known as Beef, um, who I think we'll talk about probably a little bit in this conversation. And Vicky has been based at Spike Island in our studios here for about two years. So, hi Vicky. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today and for agreeing to share your practice with us. Um, as I mentioned, um, we'll be watching some of your works together and we'll talk fairly broadly about your practice, probably highlighting some themes around analog film production, materiality, performance, um, modes of presentation, and maybe a bit about collectives as well. Um, a quick reminder, if anybody would like to touch on anything else particular um, or wants to kind of pick up on anything that we say, please put your questions in the YouTube chat box. Okay, after all that, um, I thought it might be really nice to start by thinking about the, tool, um, the tools you use in the studio and kind of for the audience to really understand some of this terminology that we'll talk about or think about. Um, and I think you have some of them in your studio for us to show. So I would really love you to give us a bit of a show and tell. Um, describe what, what these tools that you use are and um, yeah, how you use them in your practice. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, here's the camera. 16mm camera and here's the sound it makes. It looks quite heavy. It is heavy but um, it's still hand holdable. Um, so relative to other 16mm cameras it's lightweight. Okay. Um, it used to be used for newsreel. Um, so it, it, you can shoot three minutes of film on this, more or less three minutes. Um, it's very robust. It still works, even though they were made in the 50s. So it's one of the reasons why I like it, because um, it, it lasts and you, there's not a pressure to sort of upgrade, which obviously you get with digital. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, one of the reasons I work with analog is simply because it's what I have when I started making films in the eighties. Um, there wasn't really digital, there was some video, but um, working with analog seemed the main way, Super 8 or 16 mil. Um, and, and it's just what, it's just the kit that I have. So, um, it's not that I'm fetishizing it or anything. It's simply um, the tools that I have that work well. Um, exactly, exactly. And did you have some film as well? So I yeah, I do. I'd um, love to see some. Yeah. So this 
So the, the film I'll show you is actually not the film which um, goes through the camera. <laughs> so most of the work that I um, do have been doing over the last 10 years is actually um, made without cameras. So that's yeah. by marking straight onto the film strip. And here's another type of a way of marking. And what type of film is this? So this is just junk film, basically. Okay. It's called Leader. You can get it as black or clear and you can perforate it or just make marks on it. And that film doesn't go through the camera? You can't, you... No, it doesn't. It's it's something that they use in the film industry for um, just going on the outside of the film reel to protect it. Um, oh, wow. So, you know, there's a whole genre of artists who have worked with just this sort of detritus from the film industry. Peggy Arwish is one. Um, there's some other bits I want to show you, which is... Great. Uh, This, this will become relevant when I when we look at my most recent work. So these are tubes which you can attach to the camera um, and they um, bring the lens right close up to the thing that you're filming. Mm -hmm. So they um, allow you to do macro. So it's an extreme close up. Uh, and I've got reasons for working that way. And then one other tool is this, which is the developer tank. So um, it's sort of like 35 mil stills photography, um, except you load 16 mil film in there. Um, and then you put the lid on and it's sort of like a little dark room. It's light proof. Um, so those are the main sort of tools that I work with. And how did you how did you come to learn? I mean through your through your studies you came to become really familiar with these materials and these and these techniques? Yeah it was partly during my degree um, and it was actually Guy Sherwin who's a sort of quite well known experimental filmmaker who sort of introduced me to all of this. Um, and Afterwards, then I started working at the London Filmmakers Co-op, um, which I could talk about more if you are interested. I think we might get on to it a little bit later, but okay. definitely, definitely want to touch on that. And I, I was just wondering about the um, the rare scarcity of these of these materials and the camera and the film. Like, are they are they readily available for people to to use and play around with now? Or are they hard to get hold of? Well, you've got to know where to look for them. But, but some of this is just on eBay and the prices fluctuate according to how popular it is. But you'd know, Rosa, that a lot of artists are working with 16 mil and Super 8. Um, and they also want to exhibit in that way, so um, in galleries. Uh, so I think, what, what's his name? I've forgotten his name. Two exhibitions ago, he had two screen piece in the gallery mm -hmm. here, um, which was 16 mil. Exactly. So I thought it might be um, a good time now to actually work at, look at some of your work that you've made. Um, mm. We're going to screen a work from 2014, I think called Noisy Licking, Spitting and Dribbling, um, which is about three and a half minutes long, which um, you should be able to go to now.
great. So that was Noisy, Licking, Dribbling and Spitting by Vicky Smith. Thank you so much for letting us screen that, Vicky. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the process of making the work. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, for one, I was doing a PhD at the time and I sort of uh, framed my inquiry as being relating to the animator's body. Um, and within the genre of uh, works that are made directly onto film as noisy licking, dribbling, spitting is, um, it's referred to as the handmade film. And I suppose part of my inquiry was um, how to ma make films beyond the handmade. So by using the full body. Um, so that's sort of um, noisy licking, dribbling and spitting as the title suggests is made by the mouth alone. Um, and, um, and the sound that you hear, the reference to noisy is because the marks that I made crossed over from the image into the area that goes into the soundtrack. So it's in a way it's synesthetic. It's like what you hear is what you see and vice mm -hmm. versa. Um, and um, yeah, it was made, uh, so I was thinking about processes of the body that were, because making things by hand is quite labor intensive, making marks repeatedly by hand. So I did a sort of a series of works that were more um, about the way that the body could make marks in, in sort of automatic ways. Um, so I did um, the licking piece, and then I also did um, something involving my feet and my bike and uh, yeah, that, those were the main sort of methods that I used beyond the handmade. And, and when, you, when you are kind of licking and dribbling and spitting, is this quite a quick action? Like when you were kind of making this film, is it, is it yeah, quite a, a speedy thing or are you kind of really spending a lot of time on it? No, you know, and this is one of the interesting things actually that uh, prior to, these direct films I, I used my my and uh, my films were very quite labor intensive because I was a painter and I was trying to bring things that I knew about painting into animation but actually that made it sort of quite cumbersome um, and uh, in many ways the best animation is that which is uh, less compositionally detailed so what I was able to do with this one was um, um, yeah, it was very immediate. Once mm -hmm. I took this sort of concept, it, it just took a couple of days. And in fact, um, that's the case with these direct films. Um, it, it was shown fairly recently in um, a, a context of brutalist art, Jean de Buffet at Barbican. And um, the screening was called Raw Vision. Um, and I, I, it, it's certainly the case that at that point in time, for various reasons, I was needing to work in ways that were really urgent and immediate. Um, and yeah. the, and the, where I used to work didn't make sense anymore for, for personal and practical reasons. Yeah. Oh, I love how, it, how you were saying how it's, it was kind of um, a reaction to what you were making. It must have felt like quite um, almost cathartic or a relief maybe to make, to make work in this different way. And I'm I, um, I really love this quote that David Curtis says about your work. Um, um, I'm going to quote for it now if it's okay. In Vicki Smith's works, the body feels very present. Her techniques for direct mark making on the film's surface are astonishing. Things dribbled onto the film strip, things scratched into it. The film strip too is paramount in Vicky's films. And, um, and I think especially as we see in noisy licking, dribbling and spitting, um, it's really physical. And for me, this work almost feels a bit a bit painful at times. It feels a bit, there's kind of an ag aggression to it maybe. maybe. Um, and your body is obviously really implied in this. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit further about how you use your body in the work. You said you started with the mouth. And um, I think we're going to look at another film with the bicycle in a few minutes. But um, yeah, could you talk about how you um you do use a body and how you continue to develop that method. Well, it, so as I said, I worked at the London Filmmakers Co-op 
And um, I, I don't know if I'll answer your question exactly, but there's certainly a lot of sort of ideas and histories that inform that piece. Sorry, my phone's going off. Um, the, um, what was important to a lot of the London Filmmakers Co-op practitioners was um, structural materialist practice, um, which is where um, a big consideration is given to how to um, make film in the absence of narrative. Um, so uh, that's one definition. Um, so in the absence of a uh, beginning, middle and an end, as it were, um, how, how might I go about um, creating a different type of shape or um, tendency? Um, so with noisy looking, dribbling and spitting, it sort of references two types of um, practices. One is structural, because what I did was I actually stained my tongue and printed it directly onto the film strip. Um, and that occupied about six or seven frames, the print of my tongue. And then each time I printed it again, I reduced the number of frames by one. So it's a real, it's actually quite a rigorous system. Um, and that's why you get the sense of acceleration. Mm -hmm. um, the natural next thing to do was to spit it all out. Um, yeah. But even then, I wanted to create a sort of sense of differentiation on the soundtrack. Um, so at that point, I dribbled and then I just spat. And that sort of, um, in a way, I suppose, is a bit sort of informed by action painting, but it's in a way a bit sort of, of, a, a, of a, a bit ridiculous because obviously the canvas, as you've seen, is only this um, this size. Mm -hmm. um, in a way though, what you lose in, in the frame, you gain in length. So you could repeat the same marks over and over. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you also get a rhythm to it as well. Yes, yeah. And can create more and an attention or I like what you were saying about you're reducing the frame to kind of make it more kind of expedient or something. Yeah. Um, you, this, I understand that this one wasn't kind of performed, but you do sometimes um, create films and perform them at the same time. And I was wondering if you yeah. could um, talk a little about this, how you developed that and um, I think you kind of relate, uh, made made it in relationship to some of your former tutors methods as well yeah yeah well um so I was as I've said thinking about ways of making marks directly onto film but not using the hand um and I I've been very influenced by uh, for example some of the London filmmakers co-op artists such as Annabelle Nicholson so Annabelle made a piece called Real Time, um, where she, uh, it was a piece of expanded cinema, I'll explain that in a moment, um, where she put her sewing machine into the uh, performance space and a film projector um, and, and project, um, filmed her, um, performed sewing the film strip through the sewing machine which the film strip was a loop and it passed through her sewing machine and then um, through the projector. So it made this constant loop. So it was going through two machines. And um, I, she's put a lot of emphasis on the fact that she liked to sort of um, um, put the body in with the technology um, and to make it um, accessible for herself. So it's quite a sort of feminist thing. Um, along with, say, Jill Etherly, who used her broom in performances. So this was in the 70s. Um, so female practitioners from the London Filmmakers Court were bringing tools that were associated with, largely with the domestic, and they were bringing that into the performance space um, of film to sort of um, comment on the dual role of being artist and housewife and that sort of thing. Um, but then um, I think it's Lucy Reynolds, actually, it wasn't my concept, but Lucy spoke about, or she turned it into sort of theory, um, whereby 
um, instruments that are not um, common to cinema are then brought into the cinematic situation. Um, uh, and, you know, a different sort of thing is created that way. Um, so, yeah, I just thought, like Annabelle, I just thought about the things that were most, um, that I most used in my life at that time. And it was mostly what I did was cycle and make films. Um, so I brought the two together in an expanded film context. Um, and that was um, how I made Bicycle Tire Track. Fantastic. So I think we should probably, um, we should probably watch Bicycle oh, Tire Track <laughs> after talking about it. Yeah, um, okay. It's about three and a half minutes long again and starts with about two minutes of silence. So um, just to let the audience know, do not adjust your audio settings. I'll, um, I'll just add, um, okay. yeah, that in the clip, there's also one minute of uh, 33 frames a foot that goes. So it's the tracks that were made by the performance of 33 frames a foot, followed by Bicycle Tire Track. Fantastic. Thank you. Great, so that was Bicycle Tire Track by Vicky Smith. Thank you again for letting us um, have a look at that today. And I was wondering if you could um, yeah, talk a little bit about the film, how it was made, the situation in which it was, it was made. And um, you touched upon it a little bit before you we were talking about expanded cinema. I was wondering if you could um, 
yeah, expand, <laughs> expand and expand a little bit for the audience as well. Yeah, um, so expanded cinema is uh, it's a it's to address the fact that in normal cinema, mainstream cinema, the the thing that you're watching on screen bears absolutely no relationship to the space of viewing. So um, the idea with expanded cinema is to bring um, the act of making uh, in in alignment with the space of space of viewing. So, um, for example, in Bicycle Tire Track, that's what I do. Um, and 33 Frames a Foot is that I, I perform the making of a film, which is then immediately projected. Um, so, for example, in Bicycle Tire Track, you'll have seen, um, I think, that one was where I did it at Exploding Cinema. So it's the first time I did it, actually, in a public event. And um, it was quite uh, chaotic. But, um, I, I don't know if people picked that up from the clip itself. So, I, uh, you know, it was very busy and it was almost like vaudeville. There was lots of acts happening all at the same time. Um, and um, there was a lot of people sort of standing in the way of my cycle path. Um, and just so um, I actually made eye contact with Paul Tarago, who runs Exploding Cinema, and uh, actually rang my bicycle bell. It just felt like the inevitable thing to do and people actually cleared a path. So, um, but, so I cycled with painted tires along the length of the film strip. Um, which was already loaded into, into the projector. And then I turned the projector on and you immediately see the tracks. Um, of, and you can hear it as well. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can see and hear the tracks of my path. Um, yeah, straight away. Um, but obviously I can't always stay on the path. So, uh, well, I also did the piece at Tate Britain mm -hmm. soon after that, which was altogether a different sort of environment. Um, where everyone just sat quietly along the edges of the path. And it was at the new Tate um, room called Grand Saloon. And they were very concerned that I didn't get any paint or anything anywhere. Um, <laughs> so I actually, this time I used really sort of strong black printing ink um, because there couldn't be any sort of pretense I, I had just come in off the street, you know, because it was obviously very set up. So I just used this strong black ink, um, which actually was quite sticky. It took a long time to dry. So um, we actually had to pull the film through the projector. But anyway, people didn't seem to mind. Um, and then finally, I've done it at the Brunswick Club in the um, Skittle Alley. So again, coming back to that sort of sense of it being um, a bit vaudevillian. Yeah. And so to show this work, it always has to be a performance. It always has to be yeah. done by you. Um, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't exist kind of separated from you almost. No, although interestingly, other um, people who've worked in expanded cinema, such as Guy Schoen, who I mentioned, um, has actually made his work. It's pos He wrote it down as a set of instructions. Um, and so therefore um, he, he has made it possible for mm -hmm. other people to perform it. And in fact, I think he's quite sort of keen on, on having it um, po possible for others to perform when he feels like he's too old to do it himself. I'm, I'm not thinking of longevity like that so much. <laughs> not thinking of that yet, um, maybe. Um... So uh, you talked about the Brunswick Club, which is maybe a nice segue into thinking about film collectives and cooperatives. And um, you were really involved in London Filmmakers Cooperative um, and of course a founding member of Bristol Experimented, Experimental Expanded Film. I always get that wrong. And um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the London Filmmakers Cooperative, how you got involved um, and what appeals to you, I suppose, in, um, in working in these collectives or cooperative models. Um, well, uh, I've mentioned Guy and how he, I came about the film co-op, um, but I was, suppose I was really interested in um, the fact that uh, 
the endeavour at the film co-op was to have all the tools of the film industry in one environment so that artists could um, make make their own practice that was also very quite theorised, you know, so it was a real sort of strong relationship between making and, and reflecting um, and the possibility of having a highly materialist practice outside of the film industry. Um, and um, and I've, I've just bought this to show its moving image review and art journal, um, because in that, um, more Jacan um, writes about this thing that she programmed called Real to Real um, and her basic, uh, and, and so one of my earlier films is in, was in that. And it was a sort of retrospective of feminist practice from the London Filmmakers Co-op um, that at, at the time, um, there was a lot of theory about how to avoid the gaze and the sort of more um, um, oppressive conventions of dominant cinema. So you had like Laura Mulvey um, mm -hmm. um, um, finding ways of uh, um, circumventing pleasure um, through through other methods, um, and this is something that Maud talks about, which is that the um, um, the, the practitioners of the film co-op were creating pleasure, but through a sensory appeal. So through things like the haptic, which is um, where you're invited to feel a strong sense of where the viewer is invited to feel a strong sense of um, tactility through the work. So it's appealing to the senses um, through um, DIY practice. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh, and, and for the for the audience who may not know much about it, could you could you talk a little bit about the London Filmmakers Cooperative and what it was and the, yeah. its significance? Well, uh, it was set up in the late 60s. Again, I, I've said by artists who wanted to have autonomy over their film practice. Um, and there was uh, a workshop, a, a distribution library and a cinema. So the possibility of just making work um, immediately and projecting it. That, uh, so it, it was a form of autonomy from the film, um, from the film industry, which was important at the time. Um, and yeah, so you asked about beef, um, and I guess that was sort of a similar, um, mm -hmm. uh, what would the word be, in, imperative in a way, um, which was to find. Uh, to, we've sort of pooled our equipment, so certain beef filmmakers, um, and I have found that enabling here in Bristol because one of the things that was sort of lacking um, that Kim Knowles, Louisa Fairclough and me um, found that there was a lack of um, provision for experimental film. And I was teaching a bit at UWE at the time, um, and it really felt that none of the universities in Bristol were on the curriculum, had mm -hmm. any sort of engagement with experimental film. Um, so that, that's sort of how Beef came about. And, um, uh, and now it's sort of part of a wider international network of film, film um, DIY film labs, which have all sort of sprung up as a response mm -hmm. to the demise of film in the industry. Fantastic, and I'm, I think um, we'll put some links to um, to Beef in the YouTube chat so people can find out more by themselves. But um, um, we're swift uh, um, running out of time, but I'd just love to quickly touch upon a bit more of a recent work of yours, um, Re-Exposure, that was part of um, a recent exhibition at Arnold Feeney. Um, I think we're going to uh, show a few um, short excerpts of it. Um, and then talk about it a bit, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So if you have just, any... Just oh. show one clip. I think that will illustrate okay. the ideas as we're short of time. Perfect. So, yeah, let's um, let's just show one, and then we'll get back and talk a little bit about it and um, hopefully take some questions from the audience as well.
Hey, look at this. Look. Look at this. Look and touch. Be quick, though. It keeps changing. My skin is changing in ways that I've seen happen already to my mum. I find black and white photos of my mum and with her mum. They're always at the beach. They look happy and warm. The tones are warm. Great, so that was um, a short excerpt from um, Re-Exposure by Vicky Smith. Um, and this, this work feels a little bit different to what we've been discussing and what we've seen, um, perhaps a little bit more narrative driven and um, uh, you, you kind of appear in it um, a bit more physically, I suppose. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit on how, how it might feel like a bit of a shift in your practice. Yeah, well, so I was saying about the International Film Lab scene and beef, and um, it was also through having a studio. So these are the factors that came together, which is that I'm sort of in one place more now. So I've been able to slow down. And um, I've also learned um, through the International Film Labs and Enabled by Beef, I've learned how to um, make <clears throat> film developer in ways that are, isn't toxic to the environment. It's just um, out of, ingredients that you use in your kitchen. So that, um, it, one reason why I had stopped working with the photographic because I was actually concerned with the um, toxicity mm -hmm. of, um, anyway, all artistic practice has a carbon footprint, but um, I, I felt that this was less impactful. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so for these reasons, I came back to using a camera. Um, mm -hmm and uh, working with the photographic again. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to carry, I wanted to continue with the idea of, um, I'll just pull another book to the screen, with the, con with the notion of aesthetics of contact, which is what Kim Knowles um, writes about my work and, and others. Um, and um, her, her, theory is that, uh, you know, in my work, for example, um, there's a lot of, uh, I still use the close up and I, and I do in re-exposure as well. Um, but that it, it, it's, it's, um, it's the close up, but not it, I'm dealing with the stuff of emotion, but not in a dramatic way. Um, and um, I guess some of the gestures in re-exposure itself uh, reference film as a material system. So for example, you see Poz and Neg in mm -hmm. one shot. Um, you see me manually pulling the film over the light box. Again, these are strong references to um, the feminists of the film co-op, Liz Rhodes, Sandra Lahaya, Annabelle Nicholson, um, and but also the idea of the haptic and, um, and, and being very close up to what you see. And it's also because I have never really wanted to work with explicit imagery of the human face or body. So I've always just found ways of working with its trace. Um, and because of this way of working now, I feel like it, it defamiliarizes the body or the face enough. Um, and so th these are all factors that have led me to work in this way yeah I mean it's really exciting and I think it's a, it's a really really special work um I've got a few questions for the audience um I have one from Olivia Jones asking about sound and how the marks um what well, sound in general in in the 16 millimeter work that you're making and then how the sound might the sound that you're creating on the strips might record as sound might what? That, that might record as sound I don't know what that means. Um, maybe we'll just talk about sound and how, how you would kind of tackle 
um, recorded sound with with the image as well? How do how do they work within your practice? Uh, well, the the ones where the marks are made directly into the film strip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, there's no question. It's like what you hear is what you see. It, there's no choice. It's not arbitrary. It's mm -hmm. it's a fixity. Yeah. Um, the mark, what you hear is dictated by the marks that are made. Ah, uh, so it. So, so yeah, there's so a rigor there. Mm -hmm. um, with re-exposure, yeah, I was, um, and I might want to work more with my voice in the future. So then you do get um. In, in, into yeah how, how do you work with the voice in ways that are not arbitrary yeah so that's a that's a challenge basically yeah I suppose when you're when you're, you're thinking about um we have another question from Jane Farham um asking about the influence or just the ideas of Peggy Awish and how they might have affected your your thinking and your practice um and also she's particularly interested in the connection with Awish's kind of earlier films that we have on show in the screening room where she's kind of using more ready-made and damaged or kind of rotting, um, rotting film. Well, I don't think I was so aware of Peggy's work because she, you know, up until more recently, because she's more US avant-garde than UK <laughs> experimental. Um, uh, but I suppose I've found more, more as Peggy has, um, become more of an animator, I guess. I've taken more interest in her work um, and particularly Colour of Love, which is on in the gallery now, um, which is a found film that in many ways uh, works with the sort of idea of fluidity in the emulsion because it's sort of um, lost its form. It just becomes like a, a flow of red. So I guess, you know, those those ideas interest me because um, of the way of working within the frame or along the whole film strip, as, almost as though it were a canvas. So yeah, more recently is the answer about Peggy's work. Fab, I love what you were saying about the colour of love as well, the flow of that. And some um, yeah, it's it's quite a special work. So um, just about to tie up, but I wanted to I wanted to bring it back to the studio a little bit. Um, and I was wondering what your what what do you do in the studio? What's your day to day activity? Kind of what do you, what do you get up to? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of you know, emailing, having Zoom calls with us, of course. But um, yeah, what what was the type of activity that takes place? It depends. I think if I'm making work, it will be quite concentrated. I mean, I say making work. I mean doing artwork. Um. Oh. I can't really move the computer around enough to show you bits and pieces, but um, I'll, I'll shoot stuff. Um, I'll shoot stuff. And sometimes I'm just here doing teaching on Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. um, I write as well. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm really, um, I, I tend to just do, I, I dabble a lot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a fidget. It's one reason why I do physical film. I can't do it on computers because I'm like, I'll do a bit of this and then a bit of that. And it's quite heterogeneous what I do. Yeah, on the, on the digital idea, actually, James Norman's just asked a question about the cost of 16 millimeter film um, and how that might limit or affect your practice at all. Well, well, it doesn't because um, I, I think I've said that I just work with what's already thrown away in many respects. Um, also because of beef, we know um, where to get certain types of film stock mm -hmm. inexpensively. Handy, some good contacts there. <laughs> so James, if you're interested, hit up beef for some, some top tips. Um, so we're at time now. Um, so I just wanted to really thank you, Vicky, for speaking to us this afternoon and for sharing your practice with us. Um, thank you to everyone that's tuned in and engaged with us today. And thanks to my colleagues, Olivia Jones, James Parham and Safia abrahamovic Venner. If you're interested in more radical filmmaking, I strongly encourage you to come and visit one of our current exhibitions at the gallery, Vision Machines by American artist Peggy Awish. And at the same time, you can see another exhibition by Cornwall-based artist Lucy Stein called Wet Room. Please check our website, 
for future events. Um, we have a fantastic talk online tomorrow at 6 p.m. It's a conversation between exhibiting artist Peggy Awish and film scholar and exhibition co-curator Erica Balsam. I really hope you can join us. Thanks again, everyone, for being here today. Thank you again, Vicky, and goodbye. <laughs>